So today I'm going to be talking about designing for relationships. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you design software for relationships. But more importantly, I'm going to be talking about how do you design a company, a team, an organization so that it is built in a way that it fosters really strong relationships with the users and customers that help you grow. Um, there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of slides, a lot of examples, and a lot of eye candy. I want you guys to know that I'll just tweet a link to these slides that you can download after uh, the presentation. So don't worry about having to scribble anything down. Just sit down and enjoy the show. Um, my journey into entrepreneurship uh, started in a room not unlike this one. And it was a very unlikely event for me. Before I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur, I had graduated from college uh, studying modern American literature and an interdisciplinary degree called digital arts. It combined computer science, art, and music together. And what I focused on was building interactive systems inside of museums and creating really kind of interesting exhibits. And I thought I would take a year off from college and then go get graduate school, get an MFA, and teach art to hippies. However, during that year off, I fell down the rabbit hole. And it started in this room. This is South by Southwest 2005. This is uh, March. And I convinced uh, two friends to come with me who I was working with at the time, uh, Chris and Ryan Campbell, their brothers. And they would later become my co-founders. And we see a talk by Jason Fried. He does a, a presentation called How to Make Big Things Happen with Small Teams. And what's interesting is that we realized in that room that none of the teams or other people that were in there were any better than us, and there was no reason why we couldn't do the things that he was talking about. So that night, um, we go back to my parents' place, because they had a house in Austin, and we register ParticleTree.com, and we immediately start the blog, because one of the things he talked about was that before you build a product, build an audience. And we had zero audience at the time, so we started writing and filling in this large knowledge gap in terms of how to create a software company. So we wrote about business and entrepreneurship, design and usability, and also programming and code. And on those three areas, we wrote tons of articles, we did tons of research, and we just shared everything with the world. And what was interesting about it is that we did this for about a year, and we started getting some traction. And this is at a time when sort of Slashdot is big. And so, I don't know, over the course of the year, we get about 35,000 people subscribed to the blog, and when we get slashed out, we get about 100,000 people that would come and see our stuff within a day. And so later that summer, after our second slash dot, Chris and Ryan, they go away for the summer. And sitting in this hot tub, they kind of think, God, if we have all these eyeballs, like we have an audience now. We sh should be able to do something. And so what we do is we come up with this scheme where, because I had some publication experience being editor-in-chief of the newspaper back in college, I say, we can take all this writing and publication that we've been doing and maybe turn it into a digital PDF that people can buy. It would be about 80 to 100 pages. And I fig we figured out by calculating sort of like how we would set up and have all the writers and interviews done that we would only spend two weeks uh, of the month building this magazine and selling it. And then the other two weeks, we'd be writing the software that we wanted to ultimately create. Now, two months into this plan, um, things were kind of stressful because the way we had to make it happen was um, there were services like Gumroad at the time, where you could easily do digital downloads. So Ryan had to quit his job and start building this digital download store, and I had to quit my job to start doing all the editorial work for the magazine. What's interesting, though, is that we didn't have enough money between the three of us for all three of us to quit our job. So Chris continued to work in his cubicle and then split his paycheck between the three of us so we can get this off the ground. Yeah, so every day he'd like come home from work, it would be immediately like, you better show me something really awesome right now, because I'm in fucking hell with meetings. So two months into this plan, after we release our first issue, um, we see that Y Combinator is about to take another batch of startups. And what's interesting is that at this moment, Y Combinator is a brand new sort of entity. entity. Um, so far, up to date, there's been 14 batches that have been funded by Y Combinator. We were the second ever batch. We were the first ones ever out in California. And we make it in there, and all we had, we didn't have a prototype, a demo, we hadn't written a single line of code of the, of the software that we projected to them. All we had was our reputation, this magazine, and this blog. And at that time, that was enough to get us in. They knew that we were a really good team, we worked well together, and we were committed to the cause, since we had, two of us had already quit, and one of us was spending a paycheck. So we start writing our first lines of code in January 2006. 
And then three months later, we have a prototype and we demo it out to a room full of investors. We secure angel funding from two investors. And then we go back to Florida and in the summer of 2006, later that year, we launched the product. And things go really well. And nine months later, we become profitable and we eventually go around our company. The product that we ended up building during that time was called Wufu. Wufu is an online HTML form builder, helps you create contact forms, design online surveys, collect simple online payments. Only thing you have to know about it is that it is a database application at its core, but it looks like it's designed by Fisher Price. So what's interesting is that it made it really accessible to all sorts of industries, markets, and verticals. Everyone sort of needs an online form or a way to collect leads on their website. And so in all of these different places, we had people using Wufu. In addition to that, we also had tons of enterprise brands that you probably know. Now, later in April 2011, so that's last year, our company was acquired by SurveyMonkey. And at that time, we were only about a team of 10 people. And because we had deliberately stayed extremely small and we had some really interesting characteristics, like we didn't have a central office, everyone worked from home, and um, we actually left Silicon Valley after we raised that initial funding and went back to Florida and operated and ran our company from there. And so we ended up being this really, really interesting outlier. So this is a graph by, sorry, here. Yikes. So this is a graph from TechCrunch. And what they do is they set it up so that they looked at all these different companies, the way they sort of raised money and how much funding that they took. And then they mapped it against acquisitions and IPO costs, right? And for the most part, everyone follows this sort of traditional line. We are this outlier far off to the left and in the middle. And um, to show what's interesting about it is that the average startup along that line raised $25.3 million. And they returned back to their investors 676%, which is really, really great. Um, Wufu, however, raised $118,000 total and we return back to our investors, 29,561%. Everyone's sort of interested, like, how do you get that kind of sort of efficiency? How do you create those kind of returns to people? And what worked for us had to do with how we decided to construct the company. So when we knew that we we're going to build software, we didn't want to create any kind of software. Software that was going to remind you that you were working in a cubicle. We wanted to build software that people wanted to have a relationship with. The thing that we knew, based on a lot of research that we did, we're a very research-focused company, was that human beings are social and relationship manufacturing creatures. We can't help but create relationships with things that we interact with over and over and over again. So whether it's a company, a brand, a tool, a service, equipment, you eventually will attribute characteristics and personalities to that object that you're interacting with and anthropomorphize it and have it be a certain way for you. And if it goes outside of those norms, it be, acts really, really differently. And we thought, God, we're going to be fanatical about this. And if our software is going to be anthropomorphized, if those people are going to have a relationship with it in a certain way, we wanted to be able to craft that relationship. So we looked at everything we could in terms of sociology and psychology, but how actual human relationships work, and then made that be our sort of roadmap. So we took that metaphor and we just took it to the extreme. So we approached all of our new users as if we were trying to date them, and all of our existing users as we were creating a successful long-term relationship. And then we looked at the research in both of these fields. So when it comes to dating, the most important thing about any relationship is that first date, that origin story, the word of mouth story about how you two met, how it all began. If I asked any one of you to tell me about your first kiss, um, how you met your significant other at this point, how you proposed, the first time you made love, all those stories are things that you have inside of your mind in a very so solid way, and they're the ones that you tell over and over again to lots of different people. And it, it, it's startling how much it makes a difference that first date in terms of like whether you proceed along that relationship or not. And I'll give you a good example. So if you're at a dinner with someone and you find them start like picking their nose in the middle of sort of the entree, right? That's probably the end of the date. You probably don't continue on along that relationship anymore. However, if you're sitting with someone that you're married with for 20 years and they're in the barca lounger and they're digging for gold, 
You don't immediately go to your lawyer and then have them file for divorce, right? They kind of shrug your shoulders and go, eh, you have a heart of gold, it'll be fine. <laughs> so, all those first impressions, those first moments really matter. And so, in a web startup, in the software, there's lots of really easy to find first moments. So the most obvious ones are things like your home page, landing pages, the login, and the sign up. But there's a lot of other first moments that a lot of people don't think about in terms of making them exceptional. And they're things like the very first email that you ever sent to them, the account creation setup, the login link, any advertising that goes back to your website, and the very first customer support experience. So on Rufu, we spend a lot of time in all these moments, and I'll share a couple that we've done and a couple of things that other companies that do. So this is our login button. It has a T-Rex on there, which already makes it pretty awesome, but if you hover over it, this is the tooltip, right? Nothing hard, nothing difficult, but it puts a smile on a lot of people's faces. This is Vimeo. This is a login page. Beautifully done, right? Let you know that this is going to be a little bit different. This is sort of their mini login, right, from the Lightbox style. This is... The sign-up page for a wine social network called Court back in the day. Um, some of the best copy I've ever seen for a registration form. First name, what mom calls you, last name, what the army buddies call you, password, something you remember but hard to guess, password confirmation, type it again, think of it as a test. Just straight up poetry right there. This is Flickr's login. And, um, the thing that's kind of sad about this is that I truly love the old Flickr login. It had one of the best call to action buttons I've ever seen. This is what it looked like back then. It says, get in there, right? Just a different level of expectations for like starting your sort of journey in photo sharing. Best confirmation page I've ever seen. This is uh, Photo Jojo. And what they do is basically is a newsletter for interesting and great photography steps. And when you sign up for their newsletter, this is the confirmation page. Dude, you rule. Thanks for signing up. You won't regret it. And they execute from that point forward just marvelously. Now, of course, everything you do doesn't have to just solely revolve around copy and also around the things that are successful. You have to always think about things that are mistakes. This is a service called Hurl, and their 404 page looks like this. We had an opportunity um, a couple years ago when we first finally finished our REST API. It was the third version of our API, and we wanted to really get people on board for creating applications. We wanted to turn Wufu into a platform, and we thought one way we could do this is have a programming contest, right? an API contest. You build some kind of integration, and then we'll have an award system. And we were trying to think of how do we make this memorable? How do we make this first programming contest we ever have something different from all the others? Well, it turns out we're really big medieval nuts in our company. Um, we take our employees out to medieval times every year on the anniversary of our starting. And we thought, God, to do something along those lines, um, what we can do is we contacted the people from armor.com and we had them forge a battle axe for us. And what we said in the contest was that if you win first prize, you win the battle axe. So, the word of mouth and the marketing for this was crazy. We had like almost, we spent almost no money in terms of spreading the word out there, but it spread on its own. And the reaction was sort of really great. And like, I think it's just I've, something about like, you know, if you go back in time and if you're a programmer, you probably think you're gonna die immediately, right? But here in modern times, if you can actually use programming skills to get a medieval weapon, right? That's some serious bragging rights. We had over 25 applications and integrations made and submitted to us, way, well more than we had expected. A lot of them were very, very high quality and included things like an iPhone app, an Android app, and a WordPress plugin. We could not have spent the amount that we had paid for the programming contest or in the amount of time that we had set up the contest to have all of these things made. And they were all made all at once, all because we decided to try to do something in a different way. When we were acquired by SurveyMonkey, we were trying to think of a way to announce the news to all of our users in a very interesting manner. And we we're trying to think of like, all right, we, we have a big thing about dinosaurs and they're a big thing about monkeys. What sort of a, you know, metaphor is out there that combines sort of dinosaurs and monkeys together? And so we remembered this video game back in the day called Rampage. And we thought, okay, we'll take this and we'll run with it. And so this is the announcement, <laughs> how we sort of set it up, right? A sweet little throwback and just let everyone know, you know, this is everything you have to know about the sort of acquisition. You don't have to worry. We're going to be working together. And it well, worked really, really well. Like, sort of like, it was, it was a sort of marvelous sort of moment where we get to announce that we're going to be acquired by a larger company and our 
customers and users were just really excited about it because they knew that we got to do something like this, which let us sort of continue sort of the trends that we had and what they sort of expected from our company. I can go on and on about this stuff. Um, one really great resource that I highly recommend checking out is a service called Little Big Details. They just put up screenshots of lots of different software things about little things that software does that sort of takes things to the next level to help people remember, hey, you know what? You're being really considerate, and this is something I want to talk about and share with someone else. Um, let me think here. So that's it for sort of the dating analogy in terms of approaching new users. When we're thinking about existing users, however, there's really only one person that you go to in terms of figuring out where the best marriage research is out there, and this is John Gottman. John Gottman has been featured in This American Life and on several of Malcolm Gladwell's books. And what he's able to do is really, really fascinating. He's a researcher up in Seattle, and he study, studies marriages. And what he does is he videotapes a couple fighting about something for 15 minutes, and he can predict with an 85% probability whether that couple is going to be together or not four years down the road. Right? If he increases the amount of time that he watches them fight about something to an hour, and then also asks them to share their hopes and dreams, that prediction rating goes 94%. What's amazing about this is they show these same videotapes to marriage counselors, sociologists, psychologists, successfully married couples, and they can't predict better than random chance. So John Gottman understands that there's something fundamental in sort of how we resolve our conflicts that determines the longevity of our relationships. And what he found out that was really, really fascinating was that it's not that the successful married couples never fought at all. Turns out everybody fights, and we all fight about the exact same things. Money, kids, sex, time, and other. And other is things like jealousy and in-laws. Now, <laughs> right. classic. So in a web startup, you can actually match all the customer support, which is the places where you're fighting with your users, one-to-one -one with all of these issues. So cost and billing are obvious things, the price and anything, anything having to do with the transaction. If you're building a tool or service that helps people interact with clients, anything that happens to the clients, people are very sensitive about. Performance is all about how long you're up and how fast. <laughs> Others is, I said jealousy and in-laws. So jealousy are things like uh, the competition, what is your competition doing? And in-laws are things like partnerships, who are you involved with and interacting with and anything that's weird with those partners are going to affect those users and they will result in customer support. And why this is so important, this fighting and this customer support aspect, is that if we look at a traditional conversion funnel, where customer support happens is in between each one of the steps. And if you know anything about sort of optimizing conversion funnels, the best thing you do is increase awareness of the next step and the second thing you do is reduce the friction to get to that step. And customer support happens at all those in between steps. So for example, I can't sign up for the website, my email address isn't working, I can't f figure out my password, I can't log in, my sessions or cookies aren't working, um, I don't know how to use this software, the software doesn't seem to be useful to me, and I don't need this anymore. All of those issues have to be addressed, otherwise you suffer all the way down your conversion funnel. So in our company, how do we approach this? How do we fight with our customers? And what we decided to do was we sort of analyzed the problem, and what we realized was that there's this really interesting phenomenon, especially in terms of the relationships between the people who create the software and the people who are ultimately going to use it, and is that those people are divorced from the actions that they create. And the reason this is is often having to do with how startups get started, right? So before you launch, when it's just the founders, and awfully it's often it's technical founders who are totally into the building phase of a product, right? This is pure joy. All they're doing is building software, and it's just the act of creation, and it's unadulterated, and it's pure, and it's just super bliss, right? What no one usually tells you is that after launch, you don't spend all your time doing that stuff, right? You're often having to do lots of other things, right, before you can get back to doing software. And the problem is, especially for people who are used to always and wanting to build very interesting things, is that they try to offload this stuff as soon as possible. They raise funding, or if they have, once they have enough money, they start hiring other people to do these jobs that they do not want. And we notice that there's a problem with this, because what ends up happening is that you lose a sense of responsibility, a sense of accountability, and humility in the software development process when you do this. So we came up with a system to sort of combat this, and we call it support-driven development. And 
it's just like test-driven development or agile practices, because all of those practices have to do with like, how do I write code that keeps getting better and better over time, right? But has a high level of quality for it, right? Support-driven development has pretty much one tenet that is a variation of a very old one, and it goes like this. The golden rule says, do unto others as you wish others to do unto you. And in support-driven developers, you have to create for others as if you have to support it. And the way you make this happen is very, very simple. No scrum, no agile practices, no like crazy sort of note-taking system. All you have to do is make everyone do customer support. That's it. And once you do that, you have this really interesting virtuous cycle where the creators are now the supporters, right? And they have direct access to the problems that are affecting the users and the customers directly. Now, this isn't a new idea that, came st that stemmed from us. Like, lots of companies have been doing stuff like that. So Craigslist, their founder, Craig Newmark, he's famously known for having a title of customer service representative. It's not founder, chairman, director, or what have you, right? He identifies himself as a very fancy customer support person. At Amazon, every single employee at that company has to spend at least one week every year in the call center. FreshBooks has a very interesting system. Before you can start your job, regardless of what, you, what you're going to be doing, accounting, design, engineering, bookkeeping, whatever, um, you have to spend two months doing customer support. And at the end of that two-month period, it's actually a very, very big deal. And what they have is this sort of very fancy uh, graduation ceremony for each person that goes through that process. So this is one of them. This guy was very into video games, so they converted the entire office into a Super Mario Brothers level. And then the graduation ceremony was for him to go through the whole access, right? It's a celebration of having gone through and understanding what the customer's needs are. At Rackspace, a company that is public, that can advertise and market themselves in all different sorts of ways in terms of technology, manpower, force, et cetera, the way they identify themselves is having the very best customer support of any other hosting provider in the business. But my favorite is done by Paul English of Kayak.com. And what he did was he installed a phone in the engineering room, and it has customer service calls directed into it. And he has every single engineer at the company handle customer support. And people have also often asked him, why would you pay $150,000 to an engineer to answer customer support emails when you can have that done for $10 an hour at a call center? And he goes, well, after the third or fourth call of them answering and talking about the problem with the customer, they'll stop what they're doing and they'll write code to fix it. And then we won't have that problem anymore. <laughs> so that's what we do at our company. Every single person that works on Wufu has to do customer support on a significant level. And what I mean by customer support, at the time that we sold the SurveyMonkey, these were our metrics. We had over 500,000 users, and about 5 million people used the Wufu form or report, whether they knew it or not. And all of these people had problems, and we would answer and address all of them, whether they're paid or free. We usually got about 400 issues a week that resulted in about 800 emails, and our average response time, Monday through Friday, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. was 7 to 12 minutes. Um, on the weekends, it goes to about, one, about within an hour, but you never go more than 24 hours without someone getting back to you and solving your problem. And we've discovered where there's two really interesting effects from doing and setting up a system that worked like this. The first was that our customer support was the best, right? The people in, in the best position to answer the people's problems were the people who were building the software. The ones who could fix it the quickest were our engineers and our designers. They were the best able to give the most informed decision. They had no reason to sort of block things, upgrade people to a upper, upper level tier of support. Like everything could handle by the people who are actually building the software and made it work really, really well. The, the other interesting thing is that we had interesting ways that we were doing customer support because we had people who were, could build stuff to help test and try lots of different experiments. So here's one that we did. We saw a talk by Kathy Sierra, who's famously known for doing a blog called um, Creating Passionate Users. And she talked about that there's this interesting disconnect in customer support between what users are feeling, which is usually frustration and disappointment and anger, and the tone of the customer support that comes back at them. It's just too happy. It's too upbeat. 
And what ends up happening is that it creates this interesting lack of empathy, empathy that you see in terms of technological customer support. And she said, I, the only way I can see to solve this is through facial recognition software on the web. Well, we are form builders, so we thought, OK, we'll just add a drop down. Maybe we can do something a little bit simpler. And um, the drop down just says emotional state on there. We were very careful in the wording of this to not write, how does this make you feel? Right? Because it immediately conjures up an image of a psychiatrist with a beard sitting in, in a couch with a notepad talking like a douche, right? It's the last thing you want people to feel when they're having a problem with your service. So we made this as neutral as possible. And what's interesting about it is that we had no expectations for this. We weren't going to triage customer support based on this. It was always going to be first come, first serve. And our response times were so fast that it wasn't going to matter anyway. We just wanted to see what would happen. And what we found out was that 75.8% of people filled out the emotional state drop down. We didn't expect anyone to fill it out, right? It was going to be really low. What's even more surprising is that the browser type is actually only filled out 78.1% of the time. So people were basically saying to us, hey, you know what? Um, in order to solve my technical support problem, it is just as important to understand how I'm feeling at this moment as it is what kind of browser that I'm using, which was very eye-opening to us. And we found out that people don't game the system. So if you don't sort of like do sort of the feedback loops that say if you act or are feeling a certain way, you're going to have support done in a, in, a, in a sort of different fashion for you, then you get very reliable in terms of like most people should be confused with the software. And, and the people who should be angry and upset should be very, very small. What's well, sort of interesting about this is that um, Lots of people really reacted to this. Like, even for a simple drop down that we added to our support form, people were like, holy cow, this lets me know that someone is actually going to look at this and someone's going to really sort of care about my emotional state about this, which was really, really interesting, right? We didn't realize that just by adding one simple drop down, you can let people know that, hey, you know what? There's some things about you that even though we can't get across from the internet, that we sort of care about. The other thing that was interesting was that support people not only gave the best customer support, but we created UX. It couldn't be a, a window, it couldn't be through a screencast, it couldn't be through observing it through sort of an analytics website, right? You had to be speaking with customers one on one. It had to be a minimum of every six weeks, otherwise, you start losing the value of it. And it had to be at least for two hours when you are interacting with the customer. So in our company, uh, our engineers actually spent four to six hours every single week doing customer support. And also, we cycled the weekends so that engineers would do the weekend support um, every six weeks, or however many employees there were that would be rotated on a cycle. And what this resulted in is we made some pretty good software. So when we were only four people, um, Jacob Nielsen uh, awarded Wufu one of the best application UIs in 2008. What's fascinating about this is that we were competing against teams who were enterprise level, had 30 to 40 people, had their own dedicated UX um, eye tracking software suites, right? And we're doing better than them because all we did was say, hey, you know what? Whenever we're having problems, we have direct access to the customer, and we always had our pulse in terms of what was causing them pain and trouble, and we were fixing those as quickly and as soon as possible. Now, on a more interesting business sort of metric, um, this is what happens when you have everyone do customer support every single week. This is our user growth curve for the first four years of Wufu. And what's interesting, and the reason I point out the first four years, is because we spent no money on traditional advertising and marketing. Right? It was all word of mouth growth. And most of that came through people interacting with the customer support service and realizing, wow, that was really fantastic. That was really fast. Now, a lot of people often, especially engineers, are focused on, how do I scale a system to accommodate that user growth curve, right? But for us, 
What was more difficult was that remarkable customer support required one-on-one -on -one interactions, and scaling that was the biggest challenge to us. So we spent most of our time scaling this graph down here. This is the amount of support that was coming in. And what you see here is that we're going at a very interesting linear curve. And the way we do that takes a lot of energy and time that's actually not spent on the product itself. So for example, the best thing you could do in terms of limiting the amount of support that you have to handle is helping users help themselves. So we spend a lot of time writing frequently asked questions, and we have lots of screencasts all over the website to show people how to use stuff. And this takes time to sort of invest and work on and build and script. But we also build tool tips all over the app to help people find information about every single feature. Um, if you click on the Help tab up here, depending on what part of the app that you're, that you're in, you'll be taken directly to the documentation that is appropriate for it. So therefore, you save a click when you go through and get to our documentation and ask for help. We spent many, many months and many iterations of our documentation. In this latest version here, we actually reduced customer support by 30% overnight. And the other thing that we spent a lot of time on was writing programming and code in terms of, of helping the people who are doing the customer support. So um, this is Yishan Wang. He wrote a manifesto after he left Facebook, I think back in 2009. He's now the new CEO of Reddit. But in this manifesto, he talked about one of the best things that they did at Facebook in terms of helping them scale was focus on tools. The more they spent time on building custom tools to handle the job, the better they were sort of able to scale customer support. So they were able to scale customer support with 60 people managing and supporting over 325 million users, which is pretty interesting. So we spent a lot of time working on our tools. So we built things like, this is an open source project that we were on called the PHP Quick Profiler. What it does is you can load this up on any PHP page and you can immediately understand sort of the database and the queries and sort of networking troubles that are happening in the system and it helps us debug things very quickly. We also spent a lot of time building code that our users never even saw. So we built, I think, over 15 to 20 customer support tools that were worked on the back end that were used by our users. And this allowed us to do lots of different things. So it empowered even a basic employee in our company to help the users out in all different aspects. So I'll show you a little close up here. What we can do here is easily upgrade and downgrade the user, get an understanding of how much customer support was coming in from the user. And we highlight and try to make really evident sort of features that users would be using that could be causing problems if they're configured in a different and incorrect way. Our support system, though, was very, very simple. The structure was basically a shared Gmail account. And anything that wasn't archived was considered an open ticket. And then when you need to assign it to a developer, you just tag it with their name. Now, because we were in Gmail all the time, we also wrote a GreaseMonkey Gmail plugin. And what this does was it parsed the email and then automate went back to our so Rufu manager system and then pull this data and put it right alongside the Gmail message up on the sidebar, right? So we can immediately access all this information and handle support. This is the reason why we were able to have really, really fast sort of support and response times because we could diagnose, access, and figure out people's problems very, very quickly. Now, what's interesting is that there's actually two different types of relationships that John Gottlieb discovered. One was that he'd see people who, if they had conflict resolution problems, they would get divorced and break up within four years. But there was this other category of people who would be together for almost 10 years, and then as soon as like sort of the kids left or what have you, they would boom, immediately divorce, right? And all of the old predictors in terms of de determining what figured out longevity didn't count there. So he looked in sort of the data and he figured out, well, it looks like it regards to long-term relationships, they're like the second law of thermodynamics. In a closed energy system, things tend to run down. You have to constantly keep putting energy back into the system. You have to keep the romance alive. Otherwise, the relationship falls apart. So we spent a lot of time doing this to make sure that the features that we're constantly building, because we're following agile practices, we're getting back to the users and let them know that we cared about them and we're doing things for them all the time. So we did your typical stuff, like we had a blog, right? And we updated and we worked on it really well. All things were announced through the blog. We had email campaigns that we sent out right, every quarter and sent this out. But we noticed that there was a problem. Like Everyone wasn't subscribed to the emails. Our open rates weren't very good. People weren't subscribed to the blogs. We had social media accounts, but not everyone was subscribed to it. Like We had all these users that didn't realize how much effort we were putting into their relationship. And what's troubling about that is that if you're doing all this effort, if you're an employee for the company, right, you're kind of 
discouraged because the usage rate of your new features aren't being used. So to combat this, we tried to think about the problem for a little bit, and we came up with something called uh, the Wufu Manager Alert System. And so what it does is, what we can do is every time we build a new feature, we can timestamp it, write a little description about it, and what happens is every time that the user logs in, we look at the last time that they log in and see if there's any features that have been built since the last time they logged in. And then when we show them, it's a little message. It says, hey, since you've been gone, these are the new things that have been built for you. Right? And it's custom to every single sort of user on Wufu. So that way, you're only getting the messages that are relevant to you because it's based on your timestamp. But this single feature shows value to our users more than anything else. I get more comments about this feature. It's like, I love that message. I don't usually go to all the links, but God, I just know that you guys are there and you're working for me, and it just makes me feel really good about paying for your service. The other thing that we did, in addition to saying, if you're gonna work for this company, you're going to support the people that pay your paycheck, was that we said, okay, we also need to make sure that people thank the people that pay their paycheck. This was injecting the sense of humility into the software development process. And so what we did was we had a four and a half day work week. And what we did on that half day was that we combined all of the meetings and sort of business development stuff and all the things that we didn't normally like to do throughout the week because we tried to keep those as efficient and productive as possible. And we put it into that day. And we thought what we'll do and what we'll figure out is so we'll start writing handwritten thank you cards to our customers. Right? And the way this came about is one Christmas when it was just the three founders and I, uh, Chris talked to me about how, you know, I wrote some thank you cards for some Christmas gifts I got back to a bunch of my relatives. And the following year, my relatives gave me a lot better gifts. Like, they're really appreciative. And I think we should probably do that for Wufu. I think that would work. So the three of us got together, and we didn't have a long customer list at that first year. And we said, OK, we'll do that. So we wrote, we took the time, and it took us about eight hours to write handwritten Christmas cards to all of our our users, just to let them know, thank you for your business, et cetera. The following year comes along, and we find out that we have way too many people that we have to write thank you cards to, or Christmas cards to, and we read, it, read in a book the ultimate question that really you should only focus on your most profitable segment, right? So we write these handwritten Christmas cards only to this like top level sort of account plans. And after that Christmas goes by, one of our users writes us and he says, hey, I really love your service. And one of the things I really loved um, when I was first using it was that you guys sent me a Christmas card that first year. And I was totally bummed not to get one this year. Ah, I know, right? Best way to exceed expectations is not to set one in the first place. So we were like, screwed. <laughs> so we thought about the problem and we said, OK, you know what? The way we're going to solve it is by stop writing Christmas cards. We're going to write these thank you cards every single week. So everyone in their company writes these. They write about five a week. You pull it from the system in the database in a queue. And there's no way that we're going to keep up with this. But we send them every single week. And it makes a complete difference. And you'll notice here, these are not fancy, right? They're handwritten. There's a dinosaur sticker. And it says the word thanks on it, right? However, it made all of the difference in terms of helping our employees understand the direct connection between the work that they're doing and the people using it and implementing that work. Now, if all this sort of emotional, um, touchy-feely stuff is not convincing you to sort of follow support-driven design practices or focus on customer support or fighting or relationships, I'll leave you with this point. And um, I'm going to be almost done with this presentation. So if you have any questions, you might want to go ahead and come up to the stand. So the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago had some research done by Michael Treacy and Fred Wazirma, and they wrote this paper about the discipline of market leaders. And what they discovered was that there's only three ways that a company can achieve market dominance in their segment. Right? You offer the very best price, the very best product, or the best overall solution. And depending on how you decide to achieve market dominance, you have to actually craft and focus your company in a very specific way Otherwise, you won't achieve this. So if you want to achieve the very best price out there, you focus on logistics, for example, like Walmart. And that helps keep your prices very, very low. If you want to create the very, very best product out there, right, you focus all your money and energy on R&D, research and development. Right? So companies like Apple do things like this. However, if you want to build the very best overall solution, you focus your company on being customer intimate. And you see this in, oftentimes in service industries like hotels and restaurants. 
right? And what's interesting about this is that regardless of the size of your company, whether you're small, tiny, have little money, being customer intimate is always accessible to you, right? So if you want to achieve market dominance and you're lacking the ability to do these other two forms, right? You can achieve that by focusing on customer support. So in summary, if you want to focus on building software that people want to have a relationship with, focus on first impressions. Make sure that people feel like, hey, when I tell the story about how I met you for the first time, it was incredible because I had all these little moments that they sort of thought about. Remember that everyone fights. And because they fight about the same things, you have to make sure that you focus on the way you resolve those conflicts. Otherwise, your relationship with them will end shorter than you expect and relationships actually. So you have to make sure that you focus on the romance, right? That you remind users over and over again that you care about them and that their needs are always in your heart. That's it. It's in the presentation. Thank you very much.